Good morning. It's truly a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Malcolm Cox. Dr. Malcolm Cox has truly had a long and very distinguished career in academic medicine that has spanned four decades. He's a graduate of Harvard Medical School and completed his residency training in internal medicine and his fellowship in nephrology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And he was actually the research mentor there for Dr. Larry Weisberg during his nephrology fellowship. He rose through the ranks to become a professor of medicine, associate dean for clinical education. He also served as dean for medical education and was appointed the, Walter, uh, the, uh, the Carl Walter Distinguished Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He has served on the National Leadership Board of the Veterans Health Administration, the VA National Academic Affiliations Advisory Council, which he currently chairs, the National Board of Medical Examiners, the National Advisory Committee of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program, the Board of Directors of the ACGME, and the Global Forum on Innovation in Health Professions Education of the Institute of Medicine. He is the recipient of the University of Pennsylvania's Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching, and in 2014 was recognized by the AAMC as a nationally and internationally renowned expert in health professions education. He most recently served for eight years as the Chief Academic Affiliations Officer for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, D.C., where he oversaw the largest health professions training program in the country and repositioned the VA as a major voice in clinical workforce reform, educational innovation, and organizational transformation. He is an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cox. Well, it's sort of interesting, thank you, Annette, that uh, 40 years of a professional career can be condensed into uh, those words, but uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. This room is unbalanced. Everyone's <laughs> on the left, or your right, so I don't know quite what that means, but if, is the entrance on this it's side? Political. It's political. <laughs> so, all right, the Democrats and the Republicans. Yeah, I won't ask which. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. I used to come down here a lot in the old days, which were my nephrology days, actually even before Larry Weisberg was here, but certainly uh, around that time, uh, to talk about medical issues, clinical medicine. I haven't been embroiled in clinical medicine for about the past decade. Uh, I've really been more involved in the national policy scene in Washington, uh, in part through the VA and in part through the Institute of Medicine. So when Annette asked me what uh, I could talk about today, I said, well, anything around educational innovation. But then I got invited by Dr. Katz to go to this forum that Rowan University is having in the next couple of days around educational innovation. So I figured I'd better save my best stuff for that. Um, and so what's the next best thing to educational innovation in this day and age? Money. So I thought we would talk about money. It may even be the better thing than educational innovation because without some major reforms in how we fund medical education generally, there isn't going to be any educational innovation. Uh, and the world's best medical education system that's been created in this country uh, over the past century or so uh, is going to decay uh, and devolve. So money is sort of important, uh, and that's my excuse for talking to you about it. Uh, so, <clears throat> Money is a big topic, and I can't possibly talk about all of it. So I looked around to see what the most, perhaps most important issue of the time is, and it's the funding of graduate medical education. 
because the funding of all medical education is really done on, in large part, on money that comes in for graduate medical education. So even undergraduate medical education is highly dependent not only on the right kind of building, the right kind of learning environment uh, with GME, but GME funds. So I'm going to talk about that. And it, it so happened that when I was at the VA, there was an idea that emanated originally from the Macy Foundation, which is a big education foundation, um, that the Institute of Medicine should look in a dispassionate way at how we might rethink the way GME funds flow. Um, and so there was a committee put together to do that. And that's really what the recommendations from that committee, which I had the honor of being not on the committee, but involved in the committee uh, work, uh, and involved in the release of the report, I thought it'd be interesting for me to, to share with you some thoughts about that. So let me start uh, in, in just a, a framing sort of way, rather than getting right down to the issue of money. Uh, you all know that healthcare is changing. And I would posit that if it doesn't change even more rapidly than it's changing now, and it is moving rapidly, the healthcare delivery system is moving very rapidly and will outpace change in education unless we do something about it. There's a resurgence of interest in disruptive educational in innovation. Now, what do I mean that by disruptive? I mean something really different that will change the paradigms around how we think uh, about uh, education. And I think there are two key issues that you need to keep firmly in mind about those disruptions. One is the full engagement of learners with patients, families, and communities. Now, it's my understanding that here at Cooper, you've begun to move in that direction with your new school and your new curriculum. Um, but that's not how the nation in, at large and medical schools in general are moving. It's a small segment of the educational community that's moving in that disruptive direction. And the other disruption is the fact that healthcare delivery is no longer uh, you know, a single individual game. The era of the Lone Ranger in medicine is over. I hope you all realize that. If you don't, get used to it. But you're going to be working in all sorts of uh, coalescing and, uh, and, and changing teams across multiple different health professions. Uh, and it would seem to me that the opportunities that this school has to move in that kind of direction with some of the nascent planning uh, with the Rowan University uh, to bring other professions together with the medical profession is an important disruption. So the key complexity in all this is, from an educator's perspective, is how do you develop authentic models of workplace learning? You know, the idea of lectures and talking heads like you're listening to now is no way really to start learning. Um, and so we need to develop models of workplace learning in the clinical environment, that's our workplace, and doing that is a complex undertaking. While the healthcare delivery system is being disrupted more and more every day, and becoming less and less receptive in many situations to embedded learning. So there's an urgent need, I would posit, to link education reform with clinical practice redesign to achieve the triple aim. Now, the triple aim, if you haven't heard of it, briefly is a concept initially developed by Don Berwick uh, when, uh, at the IHI around better care, um, better experiences of care at lower cost. So those are the three sort of aims that the healthcare system is moving towards. So let's explore that a little bit. It's a complex system we're dealing with. We have the point of care, that is the workplace and learning environment, uh, which I've shown with the blue circle, uh, embedded in the institution. Um, it might be Cooper and the medical school and all that put together would be the local institution. And all of that is embedded in a healthcare system which is undergoing rapid change. Now, within that context, 
let's see what really is going on that's of in, that is of interest to, to medical professionals. Well, the patient sits at the middle of that, and one could say, in addition to that, the patient's family, the community that the patient is part of, and so on. Um, caring is something that, uh, caring for the patient uh, and their communities is an important concept. Uh, the more caring that you deliver to the patient, the more opportunity there is for creative learning in that environment. And of course, the more you learn, the better you can do about the caring piece. So there's a sort of feedback loop in which learning and caring are is inseparable from one another. What's going on at the moment is high-speed practice redesign. Um, I'm sure in your institution, I don't know about it, but you're not practicing the way you used to practice 10 years ago or even five years ago. And at the same time, there's all sorts of talking about educational reform. But in reality, the two are linked. And how are they linked? They're linked by the patient and the learning caring cycle. And to sit around designing practice changes without thinking about the implications of those changes on education or what educators do, sit around talking about in the abstract about educational reform without thinking about what is going on in that learning environment, the practice environment, uh, is a, a rather sterile and non-productive uh, opportunity. So really there's this linkage between the two and I would posit that you need to get the educators and the healthcare system redesigners together to think collectively and jointly about how to manage the system. And of course it's all embedded in the structure and financing, that's the topic we're going to get to today, of the healthcare system. So it's a very complex system. Now, w to focus down on graduate medical education, there is, I think most people in the room would agree, a near consensus that we uh, uh, have reached a crisis point in graduate medical education. Uh, we're not uh, able to easily find positions for all the graduates of our expanding medical schools. What a disaster, what a crazy uh, way to, to, to organize uh, an important uh, profession uh, when we find difficulty increasingly in placing graduates from our medical schools. Um, uh, there never is enough money uh, to deal uh, with graduate medical education would be another point. But there's disagreement, although there's sort of a consensus that we've got a problem, no one seems to be able to coalesce around a single or a set of solutions to that problem. There are two competing battles going on at the moment, and yes, they are battles, political and in every other way you can think about. One uh, uh, a team uh, says that we need to simply expand GME funding and the positions that they support to meet projected physician workforce needs. The argument is there aren't enough physicians, particularly not enough primary care physicians. Uh, the pie that supports that out of graduate medical education is too small, let's make the pie bigger. And that's been the traditional view of organized medicine for a long time. Increasingly, there's another uh, group that says, well, <clears throat> the likelihood of expanding the amount of money in the system for education is small. And although screaming for more money has been successful in the past, it's unlikely to be successful in the present environment if we still want to be able to do all the other things in the country that need to be done. So the first group says we need to maintain the present Medicare financing system and expand the amount of money in it, and the other group says we need to modify the present Medicare financing system. So this is the sort of conundrum, the scene, that the IOM committee uh, was facing when it uh, entered into its deliberations. So the key problems here are around the physician workforce on the one hand, and the question becomes, is the current workforce, are we doing the kinds of things, are we inculcating the right skills, the right knowledge, the right behaviors uh, into the physician workforce? 
or is there a knowledge skills gap? And most people feel that there is a knowledge and skills gap. The other point with a physician workforce is that it needs to be aligned with the population, uh, population health needs in the country need to be aligned with the size of the workforce, the specialty makeup, primary versus subspecialty care, geographic distribution, and diversity. The other key problem, of course, is the Medicare financing and funding system and questions, fundamental questions are being asked. What is the justification for public financing of GME? It's been the way it's worked for the past, well, for my entire career, and that's 40 years, and it goes back beyond that a little bit. Uh, why do we think that the public, out of tax monies, should support medical education? Doesn't support any other professional education. What's special about medicine? That's a legitimate question from a philosophical and conceptual point of view. The other issues related to Medicare funding are, all right, it's, let's say we fund it medically, uh, uh, we fund it uh, uh, with public uh, monies, but shouldn't the public then know how that money is being spent and be assured that that money is going towards the creation of a physician workforce that indeed is aligned with public needs. And then, a particularly thorny issue, what is the justification of the indirect medical education adjustment? And you're going to see in a moment that in Medicare, the bulk of the money that's coming from Medicare is in this IME account as opposed to the direct medical education account. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, let me give you a little more background on Medicare funding. This is a very short history. There are two foundational questions. Should Medicare fund GME? And how should educational innovation be funded? Because in the past, there's been no directed fund, no money going specifically to rethinking how education should occur. So what are we going to do about that question? Are those two questions. Well, a lot of people have opined about that. The Congressional Budget Office and MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which are two congressional uh, organizations, have issued innumerable reports over the years, all of which can be boiled down to saying that teaching hospitals need to be held more accountable for educational outcomes and standards. If we're giving you the public money, you better at least be doing the things that meet population health needs. And that's a recurring theme in these uh, reports. Uh, multiple presidents, Republican, Democrat alike, uh, Bush and Obama, the, the two latest ones, in their budget requests repeatedly, although not enacted by Congress, has vested the uh, HHS, Health uh, and, and Human Services, that should be HHS, not HSS, Health and Human Services, with authority to look at outcomes, to look at the performance of the system, and to reduce and eliminate the indirect medical education uh, payment. The concerns that these congressional uh, uh, committees, uh, the concerns that uh, the uh, executive branch has had repeatedly over the past 10, 15, 20 years uh, uh, is that there needs to be a different way of holding the profession accountable for its educational system. Now, the profession has pushed back and traditionally says, well, that may be true, but our concerns is we don't want a government bureaucracy. We don't want socialized medicine. I mean, it's a very easy catchphrase to talk, to call everything left-leaning, pinko, communist, whatever you want to think about. That doesn't get you to the solution. It's a useless refrain. Uh, but this pushback uh, from the profession that the government can't do anything right and therefore shouldn't be telling us how to do anything 
And by the way, the government also has no imagination whatsoever. And it's simply a bureaucracy. So we don't want you folks from the government side and the public side uh, poking your nose into our business. But it's the public's business. It's not our business. We're here to serve the public. It's the public's business. The other concern and pushback from the profession is that it will destabilize teaching hospitals, which have a very fragile, supposedly, bottom line. Some do, some don't. Uh, and that by changing the flow of graduate medical education monies for Medicare, that will disrupt the financing of, uh, uh, of health care in our big academic medical centers. Uh, it may, but who would know? Since if you look at the flow of money in academic medical centers, I challenge any one of you, accountants or not, to figure out how that money is being used and where it's going. There's a massive cross-subsidization all under the table. And I don't mean by that to be demeaning about it. The money is being used for worthwhile things. But the question is, the public doesn't know how its money is being used. But nonetheless, those are the concerns that, uh, that, that our community has. Now, the ACA, uh, which as you know, um, is uh, the biggest expansion of, uh, of insurance, healthcare insurance, uh, since Medicare, uh, emphasizes insurance co coverage, delivery system changes, and the importance of primary care. It has rejected the AAMC's call for 15% increase in response to projected uh, physician shortages, and uh, to poke in the eye of organized medicine, even traditional organized medicine, even a little further, it has funded the, the teaching hospital uh, program, the THC program, with $230 million over five years to change the way education occurs, to move it out into the community, away from big academic medical centers, not entirely obviously, but in part, so to shift the movement of money in that direction. Uh, so uh, uh, w whether you believe in the way money is being used uh, or the ACA is changing things, it is another indication of the unrest in Washington, D.C., if nowhere else, uh, about the way our delivery system and our educational system functions. Uh, a private foundation, the Macy Foundation, has issued two reports, recent reports, that called for independent review of GME. Independent reviews are largely done by the Institute of Medicine, because that's its job. And so the IOM GME study that I'm going to run through with you just briefly, uh, following this slide, uh, was born. Uh, it was requested by a pi bipartisan group uh, of senators. Uh, this wasn't a, a partisan issue. It was funded by Macy, by the VA, which is where I came in, uh, HRSA, and 11 different private foundations. These were the people who were interested in looking at different ways of reorganizing the Medicare uh, GME system. It was a two-year study, 21-member distinguished committee, uh, and it went through, uh, once the committee had issued its initial report internally, uh, all IOM reports go through an internal review process where yet another group, in this case 12 additional uh, uh, distinguished individuals were called in to review the report before it was actually published. So it's gone through the minds of some thoughtful people. These were the goals uh, uh, that the, the committee had. You can read them. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in any detail. Uh, except to say that they were concerned with the production of a physician workforce with the right skills uh, that would help lead and improve the uh, evolving healthcare system. They were very concerned about encouraging innovation in the structure, location, and designs of graduate medical education programs. They were interested, as they have to be as responsible public servants, in transparency and accountability of the system. They wanted to clarify and strengthen public policy planning and oversight of GME, which is a hodgepodge 
of governance, if you think about how GME is organized at the moment. They wanted to bring some rationale, uh, rationality to that. They wanted a more rational, efficient, and effective use of public funds. And of course, they were worried about the usual unknown consequences of changing a big complex system like this. So these were some of the goals that the uh, committee uh, had. Uh, there are a number of observations they make in, in their report, uh, some of which, uh, most of which, uh, I, I, I've commented on uh, earlier uh, in the discussion. Uh, the most important one from a scientific perspective is that the need for physicians, that is forecasting, whether you need more of this, less of that, more of these kind, that, is a very imprecise science. And in my lifetime alone, we've gone through several cycles of we have too many physicians, we don't have enough physicians, we don't have enough this, we don't have enough that. And the forecasting is flawed in major ways. So they couldn't find any good data to say whether we needed more or less physicians uh, in, in the clinical workforce at the moment. And there really is a current lack of agreement on that. Even the people who two, three years ago were pushing for needing to generate more and more physicians uh, in the United States are now tacking back to saying, well, maybe we have about enough, or maybe we, we have too many. Uh, so it's a very imprecise science and very hard to crystal ball gaze and base decisions of funding on accurate predictions of what is needed in the workforce. They found that Medicare GME based payments were based on rigid statutory formulas developed decades ago that really don't apply necessarily to the current situation in the healthcare system. Uh, these uh, formulae and algorithms on which Medicare GME money is divvied up to academic medical centers were based on a time where all of training or 95% of training occurred within academic medical centers. It no longer does. They said, uh, and this is an interesting one, that uh, yes, it costs money to sponsor residency programs, but no one has ever looked at the revenue side. What revenues are generated, clinical revenues are generated by having this extra workforce sort of marching in lockstep with the attending physicians in the institution? And there are very few studies on revenue generation which would offset in part the costs. One particularly interesting thought for a number of years now has been what if we took advanced residents, fellows, and instead of proscribing the fact that they couldn't bill Medicare, let them bill Medicare. They're delivering the care, or 95% of it after all. What would that do to the system? Just one revenue enhancement sort of mechanism. So uh, there was a good deal of discussion, and the committee felt that the revenue generation issue needed to be looked at more carefully. They also felt that, okay, maybe we do need more money for federal funding for GME, but the current system wouldn't address the specialty, geographic, or diversity needs. Just putting more money into the system, which we've been doing for decades, hasn't fixed specialty mail distribution. It certainly hasn't moved physicians more to rural and underserved areas of the nation, and it certainly has had only a pinprick effect on the diversity ethnic and otherwise, uh, of the workforce. And they uh, noted that increase in GME positions isn't dependent on increased federal funding. So there was a 17.5%, here's some data for you, increase between the years of 2003 and 12 uh, in positions, despite the fact that Medicare-funded slots have been frozen. But where were those positions coming from? They were coming from clinical revenues, largely, was the funding of those. But, uh, so there's no one-to-one -one relationship. It's not necessarily that if you put more money into the system, you're going to get out the training positions that the public needs. That's the bottom line. So here is the money, and it's a lot of money. I mean, I never 
was comfortable dealing with billions until I was in Washington. And it's an interesting experience. I never got to deal with trillions. That was the sad thing. But I did deal with billions. And I can tell you, having a $2 billion budget that I had is an interesting experience because it's a hell of a lot of money. So while in the context of the overall federal budget, the GME budget is small potatoes, it is, in absolute terms, a whole lot of money with which you can do a whole lot of things, good and bad, as the case may be. So you see that fed uh, the federal funding of GME comes largely from Medicare, that's the dark uh, purple, about $10 billion, or about two-thirds of it comes from Medicare. The next biggest slice of the pie is from Medicaid, about 25%, the VA provides about 10%, and HRSA, uh, the last little piece, about 2 or 3%. So this is a lot of money that's being talked about. In aggregate, $15 billion a year are coming out of federal accounts of one sort or another, largely Medicare. That's the 800-pound gorilla in the room, Medicare. But a, a lot of money that could be... You, you, that could potentially be used in other ways if we could refinance uh, uh, the way uh, graduate medical ed education positions are, are organized. So what problems uh, did they identify with the current methodology? First of all, it's linked to Medicare volume. And this is a little bit of inside baseball stuff that I'm going to go through quickly. But for example, by being linked to Medicare volume, it includes children's hospitals. Now, don't we want to have some pediatricians in our workforce? Well, we do, obviously. So there's a special fund for children's hospitals. It has to be reauthorized every periodically, every few years, unlike uh, Medicare, which is an entitlement funding. Uh, and it disincentivizes, most importantly, ambulatory and community-based training. The money is going to academic medical centers, that's where the large the training is continuing, even though uh, it needs to be more Catholic in its approach and, and broad-based. Uh, payments, uh, the accountability thing is, well, if you're an accredited program, you get paid. That's the accountability. That's it. Now, that's not a bad thing. Accreditation, is, 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 uh, as done by the ACGME, is a pretty robust system. But should it be the only uh, factor that determines payment? Uh, if, if it is based only on accreditation, then it surely doesn't do anything to look at specific outcomes uh, such as modifying specialty mix. Because that's not an accreditation issue. The ACGME doesn't deal with those issues. It says program okay, accredited, program not okay, not accredited. It doesn't deal with these broader sort of uh, public uh, issues. And <clears throat> a particular problem is that the payment goes to the sites of the training, to academic medical centers, rather than the educators or the sponsors of the program. Right? Your GME money doesn't come to Dr. Katz, or maybe it does in this particular system. Uh, he'd, he'd be happier if it did. Yes, it uh, but it doesn't. It comes to yes. Cooper, I'm going to say. That may not be accurate, because I don't know the system here. But in general, it goes to the training site rather than the folks who should be held accountable for the use of the public's money, that is, the educational leadership. And that's a big problem when you think about it. Hard to be accountable for money, uh, for education and outcomes, when the money isn't in your pocket, it's in someone else's pocket. Uh, other problems with the current methodology? There are a cap on the number of funded slots, has been uh, for some 15 years now. And that locks in the current funding distribution. If you want to do something different, if you want to incentivize the development of, say, geriatricians, just for argument's sake, well, how do you do that in this system? Um, the direct medical education fund, which is the funds that pay for the salaries of the education folks who are dealing with, who are administering the program, uh, is linked to historic costs. There's an enormous and significant variation in per resident amounts. That is, the amount of money that each resident gets 
uh, or is entitled to in your program uh, depends on when you applied to Medicare for it. So newer programs are disincentivized compared to older programs because of these rigid locked-in formulae which happened a decade or two ago. And there's very little understanding, as I said, of what the net financial impact of this money is because there's no close, robust accounting of the funds flow within these institutions. The indirect medical education uh, account, which was put in place as a temporary measure 40 years ago by Congress to try and take into account some of the complexities of the funding in learning environments. That's how it really came about. And Congress was convinced that, well, maybe for five or ten years we needed to do something extra so that we didn't disrupt the educational process and we would take into account the fact that uh, it's a complex environment that we all live in and that we educate in. Uh, that now has uh, continued for 40 years. Um, it's always at risk because it's never been clearly justified and Congress and various commissions have been nibbling away at it over that period of time so it's less than it used to be uh, in relative terms, and it's perpetually at risk. Uh, and many places, many commissions have recommended that it be significantly reduced. If the IME is the largest part of that Medicare GME fund, that hardly allows the education community to do some prospective planning and innovation and thoughtful thinking about how to go about this. So th these are some of the problems that they came across. They had five sets of recommendations, which I'll share with you real briefly, in five areas. The public investment issue, the GME oversight infrastructure, that is who was going to monitor, who was going to watch the chickens in the coop. That's, that's what Congress is interested in. It wants to know that it gets value for its money. If we were going to work towards a new system, how are we going to pay for that transformation? The fourth issue was the actual methodology in which funds would flow. And the fifth one was Medicaid, which I'm not going to talk about at all because the committee ducked that issue and said that's a state's issue and the state should deal with it. But there should be more accountability for Medicaid GME funding too. So I'm going to talk about the first four areas and just give you a sense of the recommendations that the committee came up with. The first one <coughs> I've called invest strategically, and that was to maintain Medicare GME funding at the current aggregate amount adjusted for inflation, at least for the moment. So they sidestepped the issue of whether Medicare, public funds, should pay for it or not, but endorsed the fact that at least for the moment uh, that should continue. But at the same time, while maintaining Medicare GME funding, <clears throat> there must be a move to a performance-based payment system. That seems like a very reasonable recommendation to me as an outsider. That is, don't take the money away, keep it adjusted for inflation, keep that $15 billion, or at least the Medicare part of it, the two-thirds of it, moving forward. But at least let's look at some outcomes. Let's have a performance-based system. There isn't any system in the United States and increasingly in any part of the world that doesn't have performance as an outcome. Why shouldn't this? So they wanted to ensure program oversight and accountability and they wanted to incentivize innovation. Because if we're going to change this, it's going to take some money to change it. Both the content and the financing of graduate medical education. The second thing they wanted to do is to build an oversight infrastructure. So they did two things. The first was to create what they called a GME policy council in the office of HHS, uh, in the secretary of HHS. And this policy council, bureaucratic or otherwise, and yes, if it's located in HHS, I can assure you it's going to be bureaucratic in that sense, just as if it were located in any federal agency. But at least it gives the opportunity for some oversight. And the idea was that this group would uh, be interested in, would be uh, mandated 
to develop a strategic plan and, and accountable policies for GME funding and physician workforce configuration. You may recall, those of you who are, who are scholars of the ACA, that there was one part of the ACA that said create a workforce commission to oversee this complex issue of the clinical workforce. And indeed that was uh, a part of the bill, it was signed and part of it, but it's never been funded. Congress in its infinite wisdom in trying to nibble away at the ACA, that was an easy one, they just didn't fund it. Uh, so it's never, so this is another attempt to put together, and there have been innumerable recommendations of this sort over the past 20 years from a variety of, of, of organizations. Uh, that this group would collaborate amongst oversight organizations. How do you bring together the alphabet soup of academic medicine organizations that are part and parcel of this sort of unwieldy governance of medical education? And there would be a state-of-the-art progress report. So that was the Policy Council. The second thing that they recommended was to establish an operations center within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is part of HHS, which would manage the operational aspects of the funding. That is, what are the formulae, how are we distributing the money, collecting the data necessary to see that it was a performance-based system, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, this sounds a little bureaucratic, but that's part of having a federal government. Uh, you need, at least, you might as well use it when you can to provide the kind of oversight that's necessary. The third point was a particularly important one for those who are educators or changers or disruptors of the current system. That is, create a transformation fund. That is, put some money into getting from A to the new B, whatever B may be. The way they went about this was interesting. They, they suggested merging the present two separate funds, the DME and IME funds, maintaining the current aggregate amount, and create two new subsidiary funds with different aims than the DME and the IME. An operational fund to distribute ongoing support for training positions that are approved and funded. That is, got to get the money out of the door for the positions that exist. That's the operational fund. That would be the bulk of the money. But a second fund, a transformation fund, specifically dedicated to finance innovation in the content, that's the curriculum and issues, and funding of GME. So here was some innovation money for the first time. So two funds, operational and transformational. The allocation is shown here. Uh, you'll see that 100% of Medicare GME funds is, is on the y-axis. The transformation fund would start small, grow a little bit for five years or so, then plateau for five years and then slowly disappear, by which time we would presumably have a better understanding of how to transform the system, and the operating fund would be the bulky uh, yellow. Now remember that the operation, the operating fund is going to be less now than it is currently, even though the aggregate amount is the same. So you can imagine some of the stakeholders in the House of Medicine being concerned about this, right? Well, transformation is great, but give us more money, new money. Don't eat into the operating fund. The committee believed that there isn't going to be any new money, so we're going to have to eat, in part, into the operating fund for a period of time. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that. The fourth uh, uh, recommendation was to modernize payment methodology, and that was to change the inequitable per resident amount, create a national per resident amount with a geographic adjustment for cost of living, etc. But pay it in a different way rather than historically who got to the trough first and got their snout into the feeding trough first and let's rejiggle all that money and think about national approach to this. They wanted to set the, the per resident amount uh, to equal the total value of the operational fund divided by the current number of Medicare funded and approved training slots. That's an obvious sort of way of going about it. 
and they wanted to importantly redirect the funding stream to the sponsoring organizations, put the money in the hands of the people who are responsible for the education is, is how that can be translated. And then of course, and no one can disagree with this, implement a performance-based payment system. That is, let's look at the outcomes and those that meet the public need as agreed upon will get uh, an incentive. Uh, and this would be based on information developed with the funds from the Transformation Fund. So the vision uh, for the future uh, that comes from this report is, number one, to optimize public accountability, to optimize educational effectiveness, and to optimize cost efficiency. To do those three things, we need a more agile system with continual performance-based evaluation of both the educational process and its outcome, what the workforce competencies and numbers look like, that there would be funding incentives would be modified by ongoing review of outcomes. This is a, a common sort of a corporate methodology now. And funding would shift over time across sponsors and specialties driven by public need and expectations. And they said this should go on for about 10 years uh, until we document whether this is a better system or a worse system than the one we have currently. But at least it moves us in a direction. There's some practical implications. As I mentioned, the relative magnitude of operational and transformational funding streams will be determined organization by organization. There are some organizations who won't get any transformation money because they're not involved in that. So all their money will come as operating money and so on. That can change over, t over time. There's that flexibility. There would have to be negotiations and joint ventures writ large between the sponsoring education and educational affiliates where the training is actually happening, right? Because it doesn't just occur in one place. So people would have to talk to one another. There would need to be a coordinated collection and analysis of data related to educational finance and outcomes. Importantly, the concern about <coughs> IME being pecked at would disappear. Right? Because there is no IME anymore. So in one fell swoop, they got rid of the nibbling of Congress at the IME fund, which is reducing the amount of money coming into your hospital each and every year currently. And funding for teaching hospital, uh, for children's hospitals and teaching health centers will be sustained. So those are some of the practical implications. There are major controversies, as you can imagine, not everyone likes this. Even the whole committee had concerns about its reports. Uh, these are, 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 are always major compromises. Uh, and the, the three or four major controversies that I'll leave you with uh, are there's still a group of people who say there is no rationale for public funding of GME, so we ought to just abolish the whole system. Congressional intent in creating the IME fund is argued about. It's become a whole topic of its own right, uh, and uh, uh, that remains controversial. Physician workforce forecasting, I've already emphasized, is always controversial. And the impact on the teaching hospital's bottom line is what's led the AAMC to really oppose this report, because they're very concerned about that impact. So some thoughts about how that impact might be blunted, some arguments against the AAMC's position might be, Changes in funding based on new payment methodology would be phased in over five years. And that's what the committee suggests. There's going to be abrupt change next year. So you can adapt to the change. In addition, and most importantly, much of the transformation fund will be distributed back to the hospitals. It'll just be targeted at different things. That is innovation, as opposed to simply increasing the number of positions. So that... Uh, big academic medical centers, one might mention the Mass General Hospital, which opposes this as well, although they had their GME director as part of the committee who doesn't oppose it, but the institution does. Uh, 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 you know, you, you can think about being creative with these two funds and coming out about equal, the total amount of money 
and just changing the objectives of the program to some degree. And then finally, and this is a philosophical issue, are the objections a question of the amount of funding? We don't really know. What if this were done, the funding was changed, reconfigured in this way, and no current recipient sustained the loss? We don't know until we find out. We can sit here predicting good, bad, and indifferent outcomes forever, but doesn't necessarily test them. So <clears throat> the, the bottom line from the committee is here. Can anyone else do better than the committee did? This is their pride coming out, right? Um, it maintains public funding that is secure and predictable at least for the next decade. At the moment, it's not secure and predictable. It incentivizes, facilitates, and supports innovation in education and financing. Innovation is a good thing. It moves from a cost-based to an outcomes, value-based funding system. That's a pretty good thing. And it, re it, it changes or it replaces a distribution methodology that is outdated, inequitable, inflexible, inscrutable, and illogical, according to the committee. You'll notice all the, the words that they put in there. So that's where we stand with it. Um, I wanted just to, to thank the, my three friends who were members of the committee, Deb Weinstein, who's the GME director at Mass General for Partners, Deb Powell, who's uh, uh, the Dean Emeritus at the University of uh, Minnesota, and Roger Plummer, who's a telecommunications expert uh, in the public sector, who is a public member, uh, and my colleagues at the VA, Karen Sanders and Barbara Chang. So that's what the money story, at least related to GME, is. Uh, I don't know where this report is going, but I know it's going to impact all of you whether you're sitting in the dean's office, uh, as Dr. Katz does, to a first-year medical student. I hear you have 80 of those now or something? 72 of those, because in three years you're going to need GME funding. This is a discussion that isn't going to go away. And to the degree that you can all get engaged in it, doesn't matter which side of the, d of the debate that, that, that you're on. The more opinions, the more thoughtful critiques and approaches to this, maybe an entirely different system, but I think the IOM, I, IOM report has at least kicked the ball off. So the game is underway, and the results of that game are going to be determined by you and, the li and, and similar individuals across the country for the future. It's a game that you need to get involved in. Don't ignore it, because you do so at your own... Uh, uh, with your own problems if you do. So thank you very much. I hope this has been a little illuminating for you and good luck. You can read more about it in these articles if you like. Well, uh, uh, you're right, obviously. Uh, every stakeholder in the system uh, is going to look for their maximal repositioning advantage in any new system that comes about. So there's going to be a bunch of jockeying. But my own view about jockeying is that it's productive and useful. If nothing else, it, it forces people to sit down around the table. The educators, remember what I said right at the beginning? You can't do educational reform without clinical system redesign and vice versa. So it forces the people, in a sense, using the big money stick, to sit down at the table and figure out a new modus operandi. Now, is that going to happen? I think where money's involved, yes, it's going to happen. Is it going to be pleasant? Maybe not. But we're not here to be pleasant. We're here to serve the needs of the public. Something has to be done. And we're here to save a system that, by all accounts, is a tremendously good one, 
but is running into problems with this inflexible payment methodology. So I think it's a good thing, but can I guarantee that the people are going to sit down and be reasonable? No. Some people will, other people won't. I suspect the majority will. I can tell you that we did this in the VA, in, in essence, which has a separate funding line. And the only way I could get any educational innovation in the past 10 years in the VA was to link it to patient outcomes and changes in the care delivery system. So we sat down, the educators and the clinical practice people in the VA. Very different system, obviously, but nonetheless, a lot of headbutting between those two constituencies. And there's going to have to be a lot of headbutting. And from that headbutting will come better ideas than we have currently. So I'm optimistic about it, but is it going to be easy? Certainly not. I, it doesn't really, it talks around your question. I don't know the answer to your question. Larry. So it seems to me one of the big problems uh, in this reform of uh, GME is that there's no consensus about workforce projections. And if there's going to be a central oversight council under HHS, that's charged with distributing um, funds in order to serve the public good, there has to be some <coughs> consensus about what the workforce needs are. Yeah. Two, you know, two years of work by the IOM, really smart people sitting in a room doing, you know, doing this work, couldn't come to a consensus about what the workforce needs are. Uh, how's that going to happen going forward in a way that's going to make this a rational system that actually serves yeah. public health care needs? Well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I can say that almost every other country in the world has solved it by getting together and talking about it and setting up the right kind of studies and gathering the right kind of data. The United States has refused to do that. There's no coordinated data gathering system to lead to the kind of observations, conclusions, and recommendations that you're asking for. Clearly, we need to have a much better understanding of clinical workforce. But, um, you know, there's a p powerful interests who don't want that to happen because they'd rather have the sub-rosa under the table system where money is, well, it's mingling around, it's flowing around, and things aren't so bad now. As things get worse, as they will, as the IME, what will drive this is the IME money will keep being nibbled away and eventually things will really get a lot worse than they are now and the future will look increasingly grim, and that will drive competing constituencies together, I believe. It isn't a matter of power politics and power economics or anything else. But you're absolutely right. There doesn't, and that's why they had that recommendation. There needs to be a bureaucracy, hopefully a reasonably flexible one, that can gather the data around all of these issues, including the physician workforce. But the ACA recognized that four years ago and Congress has refused to fund that Workforce Commission. This is another attempt to get a Workforce Commission up and running. Do you need it? You bet you need it, because without it, it's hard. I mean, you've got to do some projecting, crystal ball gazing, or you, you, you can't possibly move the system in a cohesive way forward. So I agree with you. Is it going to happen? Um, only if the different components and opponents in the House of Medicine come together and recognize that we've got to do something for public need. That's what we're here for. That's a great question, and I would agree with you 100%. The rationale from the committee was that this was a seed support, a bolus of money for 10 years that would at least get the ball rolling and allow some of the new content and financing systems to be put out there as demonstration projects, et cetera, et cetera, and studied. Uh, and then eventually you wouldn't need it anymore because you'd have a new system. The fallacy in that thinking is that we're not going to have to change continuously. So I agree with you 100%. There needs to be a continual forever. How much? Who knows? These are you know, numbers sucked out of the, 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 out of the thumb. No one knows exactly how much money would be needed for this. But I think you do need a continuous, ongoing innovation fund 
Uh, every company in the United States has an R&D fund for its future. This is the R&D fund for the future of uh, medical education. So I think you're right. I think it was, mis it was a mistake, but uh, that's all I can say about that. Thank you, Dr. Fox. That's good. Okay.